Pastor Stephanie. Lord, bless them and charge them. I pray that they could just relax. God, that their strength would be renewed like uh, the eagle, Lord, that they would rise up on eagle's wings, Lord, as that verse in Isaiah says, and that you give them fresh vision, God. I pray for Amen. healing, Lord. It's been a tough week. I know as a mother it must be difficult to, in a sense, have both sons uh, leave, God. And I just pray that you fill that void with your presence there, God. And I pray that they would come back rejuvenated and, and ready to serve and that we would be a blessing to them. I also pray... For Kids Church, God, that you bless every kid who's going. Yes. May they have a tremendous week. Keep them safe. And man, may they fall in love with Jesus. And then yes. lastly, God, whatever happens in Russia, Lord, I, I do pray that that won't pass. But I know your church throughout history, God, when there was repression and persecution, that's when your church thrived, God. Amen. So I just pray that your word would boldly go forth, that you would protect your servants. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, well, this, um, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. One of our favorite family movies was What About Bob? Can you remember that movie, Bill Murray? Um, so there's a part in that movie that's kind of the inspiration for my title this morning. And if you haven't seen the movie, Bill Murray um, is a middle-aged single man. He's got lots of psychiatric problems. He's not scary. He's just happy-go-lucky, aloof, goofy. And his psychiatrist is going out of town for two weeks to Lake Winnipesaukee and I think it was New Hampshire. Well, that terrified Bob. What, what if he had a problem? He couldn't come. So somehow he, um, through some deceit, he was able to trick the uh, responder on the phone into giving him the uh, vacation address of the psychiatrist. So he shows up unannounced. Psychiatrist is not pleased. But the wife and kids... They like Bob. Hey, look, let's let Bob stay. So Bob invites himself on a two-week vacation with a psychiatrist. They end up putting Bob for the night in with their teenage son, Sigmund. Now remember, Bob is afraid uh, of being in public, not finding a bathroom. He's afraid of everything. But he's now in this beautiful, serene place. He's with his psychiatrist. What could go wrong? But then Sigmund, as they're about to fall asleep, Bob, are you afraid of death? It doesn't matter. What difference does it make if you die tomorrow in 80 years? I am going to die. You, Bob, are going to die. And you just see Bob's eyes getting real big, as if he doesn't have enough problems to worry about. So the title of my message today is not You Are Going to Die, but it is You Are Going to Suffer. Um, I, I, please bear with me. I know some of you might want to usher me out or boo me <laughs> through the first point here. But if you've ever been told, come to Jesus and everything will be rosy, everything will be easy and light, that is not true. And so um, I want to be a realist this morning. I want to share the truth with you. The Bible actually promises as Christians we're going to suffer. Now, I do also think non-Christians suffer. I know a lot of them and I see some suffering in their life. So we might as well suffer for a purpose and a cause and the king rather than just for ourselves and for shallow hollow living. That's, that's my take on it. So anyway, you are going to suffer. Let me go through a couple quick passages here in Scripture um, that clearly make this point. The first one is in James chapter 1, 2, and 4. The main verses I'm using this morning should be up on the screen. I know I'm going to go through some of them kind of quick, but they should be up there. So James 1, 2, and 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So that's James saying he's assuming we're going to face trials whenever you face them. Now let's move to Peter. Peter says, how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? If you break the law and get caught and pay a fine or whatever it might be, how is that to your benefit? You did wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. All right? So Peter now is telling us we're called to suffer. Again, I know this is like sandpaper to our ears, <laughs> but it's scripture. And it will get better. I promise point two and three will be encouraging. Philippians, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him. Awesome, amen. Amen. 
but also to suffer for him? <laughs> Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. And then Luke in Acts 14 says, They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Amen. Not getting many amens this morning. They said, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. So just to recap that, this is the first point. It's not if, but when we suffer. And it's going to be for various reasons. James tells us he assumes we're going to suffer. He uses the word whenever you face trials. Peter tells us we're called to suffer for Christ. Uh, Paul in Philippians says it's been granted to us to suffer. And Luke says it's a must. We must go through hardships, trials, difficulties, suffering. So that's the bad news. Now, um, I do want to mention that we suffer for many reasons and causes. I, I quickly want to go through ten of these. Um, and they're going to be just kind of like bullet points. I came across a book while I was um, studying for this sermon. And I guess the reason I wanted to, I just felt like I've seen people in this church and some of my other Christian friends, I just felt like a lot of them are going through stuff. And, and, and I heard for them. The Bible says we should bear with one another's burdens and be encouraging and mourn when others mourn. And I just felt there were some people that needed to hear uh, a sermon on suffering. Not because I'm wanting you to go through it if you're not. But if you are, my, the next two points, I think you're going to find some encouragement. But um, as I was studying, I came across a book called Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. The author is Tim Keller. I believe he's a pastor in New York. I have not read the book, but somebody so graciously uh, shared their 20 favorite quotes from the book. And man, they were powerful. So I'm going to be um, peppering this sermon with a couple of them. And the first one um, Tim says this, no matter what precautions we take, no matter how well we have put together a good life, no matter how hard we have worked to be healthy, wealthy, comfortable with friends and family, and successful with our career, something will inevitably ruin it. So here are 10 reasons why we suffer. First one, uh, Paul tells us in Romans 8, in the context of human suffering, that all of creation itself is in bondage to sin. To decay and is waiting for liberation. When I was younger, a newer Christian, I used to think, God, why didn't you just like turn on a switch and make me mature? Why can't I? Why can't there be no problems and we're all at the level we need to be? Well, he kind of tried that in the garden, and, and we did sort of mess it up. Um, so we need to be growing. He wants us to rule and reign with him one day. And so just as we grow, as we are physically infants and babies and have to grow and mature, we have to do that. Um, spiritually, and you do that by facing trials. So that's one of the things. All of creation, unfortunately, is in bondage to decay, and that is the main reason we suffer. Number two, as that verse in Peter said, we might suffer for doing wrong. If you keep lying and cheating on your taxes, chances are you're probably going to pay for it at some point. Uh, that same verse, though, says you might suffer for doing good. You might suffer for preaching the word, for living as a believer, for standing up for truth and purity. If you look at Jesus and Paul as they preached and ministered, man, did they suffer horrible things. But did anyone ever endure such unjust suffering as Jesus? Probably not. He didn't do anything wrong. And yet, the greatest good that I can think of ever coming to the world, to mankind, came through that suffering. That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. Number four, we might suffer because others might sin against us. How many of you know when someone breaks one of the Ten Commandments against you, it might hurt, there might be some pain, and you might <laughs> suffer? All right? If someone lies or cheats or steals from you, that, that's not fun. If we look at the story of Joseph, uh, his brothers wanted to do terrible things to him. They, they wanted to kill him at first. They lie about him to their dad. They basically sell him as a slave. But even in that situation, God used that suffering to bring about tremendous good, not only for Joseph... Amen but also for his whole family. And I love the verse in, I think it's Genesis 50, that says, what the enemy meant for evil, God used or meant for good. That's right. So sometimes we're in the middle of it and we don't see the end. Sometimes it's still Friday, crucifixion day, 
or Saturday, and, and God, where are you? What's going on? Your Sunday might be longer than three days. Yeah. It might not be, unfortunately, till, till heaven completely. But, in, but God has the final word. He has the final say. Right. Right. Number five, sometimes we are just unlucky. There's a verse in Luke 13. Um, Jesus was talking to a crowd and, and basically just said, everybody needs to repent or you will perish in your sins. And then he says this. I know some people that maybe don't like to say, use the term luck, unlucky, but accidents happen. And Jesus said, those 18 who died in the tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. So sometimes we're just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and we end up suffering. A sixth reason is because we sin. Galatians 6 says you're going to reap what you sow. If you reap to the flesh, you will reap destruction. A seventh reason, we have an enemy who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. John 10.10, 10, and who prowls around like a roaring lion looking for Christians to devour. That's our enemy. That's First Peter. Number eight, God might allow it. You can look at the story of Job. Um, or maybe a more modern, not that he, I don't know, it's hard to compare suffering from a modern day person to Job, but I thought of Pastor Saeed, um, some of you may have heard him, he was incarcerated in Iran for three and a half years and just got released in January, and his wife and kids were, I think in Idaho, somewhere in the northwest, and the whole country, many churches have been praying, had been praying years and years, but God was using him uh, mightily in that prison and God allowed it to continue until January there was I think a prison swap so he's free now but sometimes God allows us to suffer so we can minister to others right. number nine uh, how many of you have ever suffered because of stupidity I have <laughs> I've done some pretty stupid things um, and been physically hurt and my parents are here I love them dearly I used to get the wooden paddle and I would uh, not do the right thing at night and I would choose to keep pestering my brother and sometimes my behind suffered but I'm a better man for it and then number 10 um, you can go ahead and put up these so I call these syndromes QWS and SMS some of you may have suffered from these the first one is the quarrelsome wife syndrome so gentlemen uh, you might be familiar with the Bible verse Let's see if they can get that up there. It's the picture one. It's the big picture. There it is. Proverbs 21. Better to live on a corner of the roof than to share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Sometimes we might suffer from that. Now, ladies, don't get mad and offended. I have one for the gentleman. Uh, the SMS is the stubborn man syndrome. You might have a man who never asks for directions or never will open up the user manual. Will never want to look at instructions. So I have a, a picture for that. Um, here's Moses. Moses, we've been lost in the desert for 40 years. Now will you stop and ask for direction? <laughs> By the way, I once heard a preacher say that the distance they tra the Israelites had to travel from when they started and stopped was only nine days. Yes. But they spent 40 years. So sometimes maybe we're suffering because we haven't learned all that God wanted us to learn. All right, so point... Uh, number one, it's not when you suffer. I'm sorry, if you suffer, but when. We're going to suffer, and it could be for various reasons. Number two, but there is a purpose. There is a purpose for our suffering. Um, point A, for, it's for our eventual betterment. And I say eventual because sometimes we don't see the fruit of it right away. I'm going to read the, that verse in James again, because I like the, the ending part here. Consider it pure joy... That is tough to do. I, I, I don't do that. I'll, I'll confess. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. But that is God's end result. That's what he wants for you. That's why he allows suffering to happen, yeah. so that we become mature, complete, and not lacking anything. That is good and worth rejoicing for I mean, when Jesus went to the cross, horrible, excruciating pain physically, but also spiritually to bear. Imagine all the sin of the whole world just spiritually, emotionally upon him. He endured that, and it says it was for the joy set before him. So we are supposed to be joyful when we go through the, these <laughs> difficult times because we know 
At the other end, the other side, there's good stuff. We're going to be mature, complete, and not lacking anything. And again, it might not be until you're with Him in heaven, but that is the end goal. And that is worth something worth rejoicing over. Um, another verse there, Romans 5, 3 and 5. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. I think some translations say hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given yes. to us. Amen. Amen. Another one that might be cut off a little bit there is 2 Thessalonians 1.5. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. So sometimes suffering for the gospel is an indication we're worthy of his kingdom. It's like a, an honor badge. It shows I'm in God's camp. It's evidence that we're doing the right thing. Um, you might... Uh, how many of you guys have been persecuted for, for sharing your faith? Amen. I think sometimes as Christians, I've, I've suffered... It. Okay, I can be a Christian and suffer, and it might not mean I was doing the Christianly thing when the suffering came. Okay, sometimes I think as Christians, we do silly, goofy, or even stupid things, and, and we suffer. I'm not talking about that, but there have been times where I've shared my faith, um, and, and they've been tame. Compared to our believers in the 1040 window, do you know every four minutes a Christian is martyred today? That's more than back with the lions in the Colosseum. Every four minutes. Most of that is in Asia and Africa, the 1040 window. But that's remarkable. And that, that's pre-ISIS. Before we ever had ISIS, every four minutes a Christian loses their life for their faith. I've seen it in, on, on many um, websites and, and books, Voices of the Martyrs. It's a, it's a crazy stat to me. I, I can only say I think I've been called Holy Moses, Holy Roller. I used to have people throw money. Not, not, they weren't tipping me. Uh, my friend and I in college would go to the Hispanic part of the town and um, put a bunch of free clothes on the hood of his car in a corner there. It was kind of a poor area. And we had these signs that just said, I think Jesus loves you or God bless you in Spanish. And drunk guys would come by, we'd pray with them. People sometimes would honk, give us a thumbs up. We would get the middle finger. Sometimes they tried to pelt us with change. I usually just kept it. Like, hey, if you're going to leave it, I'll take it. But that's pretty tame compared to what some believers have to put up with nowadays. First Peter is a, another verse I want to look at for this section. Um, First Peter 5, 6 through 11. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. We're, we're all going through the same kind of difficulties. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now, Again, we see the end result is that we'll be strong, firm, and steadfast. So God is allowing this. You don't get, I mean, there's that, that Christian song on the radio now about God is making diamonds out of us. To take charcoal and make a diamond, you need intense and incredible pressure and heat and time, right? Or think of a, a butterfly. To become a butterfly, it's got to go through a difficult season. Or a pearl. I think it's the, uh, the oyster has sand and other irritants that come in and bother it and it's difficult. And, but man, at the end, there's something beautiful that gets produced. And that's what God is doing with us. I want you to notice one thing here. Um, we, we see that in verse 8, the enemy is prowling around like a roaring lion. In verse 9, it, it seems to indicate that the suffering that all believers are going through is because of that line. But then in verse 10, God, not, not that he doesn't care, but it says after we've suffered a little while, God sometimes stands back and allows, I mean, you can certainly see this in the life of Job, and only to a point, but who will, he will allow us to go through suffering that might even be initiated by the enemy. Because his plan on the other side 
is that we'll be strong, firm, and steadfast. Amen. I mean, did, did Satan not try to, to kill Jesus? But God allowed it because he knew, man, Satan, you don't know what's going to come out on the other end of this, on the other side. It's so much better. The glory is millions of times greater than the suffering that he's going to go through. And I thank God that he did, that we did not have to. Amen. So uh, my next section, point here for this section is point B, to know Christ better and reflect more of him. That's another reason that we go through suffering. Um, I'm going to read that. I'm going to get to that verse in just a second. So my, I wanted to discuss Paul's sufferings here a little bit. And I don't have the verse up, but I'm just quickly going to read through. This is what the Apostle Paul went through. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Whipped on the back 39 times. Five different episodes of that. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in the country, at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. This guy went through it. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. So even here we get an indication that Paul's realizing in our sufferings and pain and weakness, God is strong and his strength shines through. Amen. Paul knew suffering well, perhaps better than most of us. Now my question is for you today. I have a question. What do you think was Paul's most difficult point of suffering to endure? You don't have to answer out loud. You can if you want. You guys, have you guys ever thought of that? I thought about that one day. Um, and don't get me wrong, I have not been stoned or, or whipped. I would not want to go through that. And this is just my opinion. But I don't think it was any of those things that I just read that he mentioned there in 2 Corinthians. I actually think it's um, from 2 Timothy. Twice in that book, Paul says, everyone left me and deserted me. Could you imagine being Paul? Like you've forsaken everything. You are one of, you know, you're a Roman citizen. You're one of the top religious leaders and you're having all this stuff happen to you so that you can share the gospel with people and make disciples. And then in your time and hour of need, no one comes. Ouch. That, I think, would hurt. You know, we say sticks and stones break my bones. Words will never hurt me. I think that hurt more than anything. Amen. He says in 2 Timothy 4, my, at my first defense, no one came to my support. And actually in chapter 1, he, he also says, everyone deserted me. No one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. He's forgiving them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Now, what I'm about to read, I made up. Don't quote me on it. Uh, this isn't scripture. It's not infallible by any means. But I want you to imagine. I don't know if this happened, but perhaps it did. Imagine this conversation between Paul and Jesus. Paul says, Lord, Jesus. Yes, Paul? I can't do this anymore. Everyone I have risked my life for has abandoned me. Nobody is coming to my fence. I am all alone. I have given everything for you. Why do all these bad things keep happening? And Jesus says, Paul, remember that you told me you loved me and wanted to know me, truly know me? Well, now you know how I felt when all of the disciples deserted me. Peter, while I was still close enough to see him, denied me three times. Now you know how I felt. And now you know how much I went through to save you and be with you. Will you keep sharing my love? The best is yet to come. Paul, yes, Lord. There is no other love like yours. Now, I don't know if he, if he had thoughts like that. Um, I've had times in my life where I've been upset with God. And I just, you know, I was a missionary for a couple of years. Um, I don't consider myself even close to the type that Paul was. But I can remember thinking, 
man, Lord, why does this keep happening? I'm here to, to share your love and share about you. Why do you keep allowing these difficult things? I have some financial issues, some health issues. Like, can't you just make it all good so I can... But he, a lot of times he's more interested in us and who we are than in the process uh, and what we're trying to do. So I put this verse up here because I think there's this um, kind of a, a jewel hidden in it that we often overlook. So many of you have probably come across this. I chose this version. I've been reading NIV for every, all the other verses, but I liked how this was phrased. In some versions it says, I want to know him. Uh, but this says that I may know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I know we just sang a song, I want to know you more. Well, sometimes the best way for us to know God more is to suffer in a way that he did. It says here, I want to know you through the fellowship of suffering. When we suffer, there's a, an opportunity for us to experience a little bit what Jesus experienced, to become more like him and to have him touch that deep place of pain. And we come out stronger on the other side. Some versions it says the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. There is a closeness that happens between us as long as we don't get bitter when we get through that, when we go through that suffering. But there's an opportunity for us to draw even closer to God that we don't get when it's all sunny and good and easy. But when we suffer like he did, we fellowship with Christ in a very intimate way. God sometimes allows us to suffer so that we learn to depend on Him and that we can, that He can touch that deepest place of pain. We will not only learn to love Him more deeply, but we can then minister out of that deep encounter of love with Him. I want to share with you guys um, some quotes that I found that I just thought were very powerful. I don't know, maybe you're not like me, but I, I, learn, I love to read about other people and hear their experience. So these are some famous Christians. They're real brief quotes. I think they're powerful and I hope that they encourage you. Um, so the first one is A.W. Tozer. It's doubtful that God can use any man greatly until he hurts him deeply. Now that, I guess, is debated quite a bit. Some people say he said something different, or does God really hurt us? Doesn't he only allow it to happen? But anyway, the point is that oftentimes our greatest ministry comes out of our deepest battle or most painful experience. Tim Keller, the author of the book I mentioned earlier, says you don't really know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Right, Johnny Erickson Tata, she's still alive today, a famous quadriplegic. She says, my weakness, that is my quadriplegia, is my greatest asset because it forces me into the arms of Christ every single morning when I get up. Can't move her arms or legs and look what she's able to say. We have uh, another one here, Elizabeth Elliot. Her, her husband was Jim Elliot, martyred in 1950s or 60s in, in Ecuador. She says, I'm not a theologian or a scholar, but I'm very aware of the fact that pain is necessary to all of us. In my own life, I think I can honestly say that out of the deepest pain has come the strongest conviction of the presence of God and the love of God. The Aka Indians murdered her husband and some others, I think three or four others, in the jungle in, in Ecuador. And they were just trying to share Christ with them. But when she went back, they were expecting retaliation. Um, they were expecting revenge. She went back with some others and some other wives. And they forgave them. And many of them turned to Christ because of that example. But imagine being, coming to the place, being able to say that. Um, and, and wanting, just wanting the desire to go and see those people who killed your husband. And not be hateful or spiteful, but to have the compassion and love and grace to say, I forgive you, God loves you. Wow, only God can do a work like that. The last one, Charles Spurgeon, I'm certain that I never did grow in grace one half so much anywhere as I have upon the bed of pain. My, my last point here is that we serve the great comforter and equalizer. We serve the great comforter and equalizer. Um, I believe the gentleman who spoke here a few weeks ago mentioned this verse, but it, it was so powerful and fit in perfectly, I wanted to bring it up again. It's in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. I think we'll have it up on the screen in a minute. It's under the third point there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, 
who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any our consolation also abounds through Christ. You and I will never face anything alone. The God of all comfort will never leave us or forsake us. Sure. He is the great comforter. He is also the great equalizer. 2 Corinthians 4. We do not lose heart for our light and... I'm, I'm used to another version. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Sometimes we just need to get that eternal perspective. And I don't now, I don't want to say that we won't experience excruciating pain and suffering. I can't imagine. We, Denise and I have many friends, many Christian friends, who have gone through many miscarriages. I have one um, couple that I'm friends with in Mexico. They're missionaries. And they lost like a six-month-old. And just reading their Facebook posts, I, I mean, I, I didn't feel nearly as much pain as they did, but you could just, man, you just wanted to hug them and buy them dinner. You didn't know what to do, but you just could feel the pain. And so I do not want to say that we don't experience things that are excruciating and difficult and horrendous. We do. But the glory when we step into eternity, we'll look back at that painful moment and then it will be but a fleeting moment and it will seem tiny. So as we wrap this up, this is the most encouraging part. If you are going through something or gone through something and it still rocks your heart and, and it almost seems unfixable, Please pay attention. This last part is especially for you. We see in this verse that suffering prepares us for more glory. There's the, this famous David Crowder song now, and I love this line. It says, Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Amen. And you might say, well, I don't feel healed yet. Oh, it's not over yet. We're not, we're not in glory yet. But when we are there, it will make up for it. God will be the great equalizer. This doesn't mean we won't face times of horrible loss or excruciating pain. We might, and some of you may have. Without Christ, I don't know how someone could handle something like burying a child. But Paul is saying when we step into that glory, which will be eternal, it will make even our worst earthly suffering seem light and like a distant moment in our past. There may be some in this room who are still feeling floored by a season of suffering or pain. If that's you, let me share a story that may bring some encouragement. If you've heard of Stephen Curtis Chapman, he's a famous Christian singer. He's been singing for decades. I think I was in grade school when I first started hearing him. So um, he's, he's just been a cornerstone for the Christian uh, recording industry. And in 2004, he went to China and they had already adopted a few kids and his wife said, do not bring back another child. <laughs> Well, apparently he doesn't always listen to his wife. Seven months later, they had a new girl and, uh, adopted into their family named Maria. Um, and the story goes that Maria was with some of their other children playing in the front yard. And their older son, I think it was a, an SUV, was either leaving or coming. And the girl, at the moment, they were playing a game. They were going to go to a Jonas Brothers concert. That They were playing. And... Um, Somebody, one of the kids said, so-and-so, your brother in the car, is the one who decides who you go with. So the little girl, I think this was 2008, they got her in 2004 or 5, she was you know, only grade school age. She took off and started running towards the vehicle. Well, the brother didn't see her, and uh, she was killed. Uh, they, they declared her dead when they, when they rushed her to the hospital. And Stephen Curtis Chapman had this to say. He says, we didn't know how we're going to take the next breath. I'd go to where nobody could hear me and scream until my voice was almost gone. It sure didn't, and he, this is 2015 when he wrote this, so like seven years later. It sure didn't and still doesn't make sense, but I never felt like God had abandoned us. He's continued to write beautiful music um, even in the midst of that. And then later on in the article, referring to efforts by thousands of people that were writing them and sending them messages, trying to comfort them, also referring to an initiative started in Maria's honor that helped 80 Chinese children get adopted. He had this to say, 
We see those amazing things, and yet we still carry the sadness and the grief. It's a completely unfixable, broken beyond repair situation until heaven. In heaven, and only in heaven, will this make sense. So sometimes, guys, we go through things that are not going to fully make sense. And it's like we're trapped between that Friday and that Sunday. And it might be a lot longer than three days. But you have tasted God's goodness, and you've tasted His love, and you know that in heaven it will make sense. The glory will outweigh the pain. The last verse I want to mention is a powerful one. It's um, found in Revelation 21. This is the last verse of the sermon. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. This is the part I love. And this is for you if, if you're feeling like the Chapmans this morning. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or suffering or pain or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Yeah. Keller, in, in his book, I'm, I'm guessing it's in relation to this verse, says this, Resurrection is not just consolation. It is restoration. We get it all back. The love, the loved ones, the goods, the beauties of this life, but in new, unimaginable degrees of glory and joy and strength. So my takeaways this morning are these two things. Number one, get better, not bitter, when suffering comes. Think about Paul and Jesus and Joseph. And it's easy to, to get bitter and, God, why me? Why, if you're so loving and good, why is this happening? But step back and know, man, God can use even the, the vilest, most sinister things. He can use the crucifixion of an innocent man to bring about immense glory and goodness. So get better, not bitter, and ask, what are you trying to teach me, God? The second one is stay missional. Stay missional. In the midst of suffering, sometimes there's great opportunity to minister to others. Great oppor opportunity to share the love of God. And a lot of times that is part of your recipe for healing. My last story this morning um, is going to come from Corey and Betsy Ten Boom. This is from an article called How Suffering Helps Us Make the Missional Shift. This is uh, by Tim Sutherland, 2013. When Corey and Betsy Ten Boom arrived at Ravensbrück, a notorious Nazi death camp that killed nearly 100,000 women, they spent their first night in an open field hiding from the drizzle under a thin blanket. After three days sleeping out in the open, they were taken to an intake barracks, a building designed for 400 women that then held 1,400 un unfathomable conditions. After a month there, they were taken to Barracks 28, which would be their last stop. The first night in Barracks 28, they listened to the sound of fighting as it erupted throughout the room, a burst of shouting, the sound of slaps and punches, sobbing, and then the quiet, mournful tears to which they fell asleep. Betsy remarked that there had been too little praying in that place. Amazing to have that kind of spirit. We should pray more. I, I would probably be uh, in a different mindset. And the two sisters set about to change that reality. They began to lean into a verse from 1 Thessalonians, which uh, I didn't know they were going to have this video. You guys saw it at the beginning. So it's kind of neat that this was my closing verse. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. Yeah. That's what they held on to. This verse began to guide their approach to their own captivity and torture. In their barracks at night, they would huddle around the scriptures. Betsy would read a passage, and the women closest would translate the Dutch text into German, Russian, Polish, and back into Dutch. Then the words would be whispered along like a game of telephone until they had reached all who wanted to listen, all who were huddled around the two sisters. Then Corey would preach. She would tell them the Nazi narrative was false, that human beings had dignity, that life was precious, and that this incredible evil was not stronger than the love of God, so it would be defeated one day. Corey's words would be translated and passed around the room as well. Over time, something strange began to happen. 
the women started to believe it was true. Barracks 28 became an oasis of peace in the midst of a storm of hellish violence and torture. Every night the women could look forward to at least a few minutes, sometimes an hour or more, in which to gather with other women to read the scriptures and pray. It became for them a source of strength. They were a little colony of heaven in a culture of hell. You cannot make sense of suffering. You cannot reason with it or make sense of it. The question never goes away because the answer lies in learning to transcend the question. In that Nazi death, death camp, Corey and Betsy Ten Boom were able to stop asking the question of suffering. Is God good and all-powerful? And start started asking the more essential question, how can I serve God's kingdom here and now? The movement from that first question to the second is the movement all of us must learn how to make. The movement away from endless questions about God's power and goodness and toward the missional question, what is God doing in this place and how can I join with that mission? Amen. It is the difference between despair and hope, the dehumanizing power of suffering, and the amazing beauty of peace. If the worship team could come up, I'm going to... Uh, just have a, a time of prayer here at the end, and maybe maybe Sharon can just play the keys a little bit, um, and then after I pray, I wanted to have a, another, if you guys could play another song or two, just wanted to give people a chance to respond. So some of you in this room might be uh, at a place where, where you're dealing with suffering, you're dealing with pain. And maybe you're struggling not to get upset at God and then to keep asking those questions. I've been there. I've done that recently. And, and so maybe today you can just say, hey, God, help me to turn my thoughts and to turn the questions from, why is this happening? Don't you love me to, I know you love me. You, you showed it on the cross. What can I do in the midst of this? Can I still be a minister to people around me? And like I said, a lot of times that will be part of the ingredient for your healing. Or you might be like the Chapmans today. Maybe you are just, you find it hard to, to even worship God because your heart is filled with so much pain. Either way, God wants to comfort you. And whether he does it completely now, today, or in heaven, we can hold on to the hope that we have that one day it will all be made new. One day we will get it all back. The goods, the loved ones, the dreams, whatever it might be. God is going to make all things new. So if everybody could uh, bow their heads and close their eyes, I'd like to just lead you in one prayer, and, um, and then the altars will be open. And um, when I finish this prayer, if I've asked you to come pray and be a, a prayer person up front, you can go ahead and do that. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. It, it does seem counterintuitive, God, to, to say thank you for suffering. We don't understand it. It, it is painful. None of us, God, go looking for it. But you do say it's going to happen. But you also say there's a purpose and that you desire to use our pain and suffering for good, to make us stronger and better, to make us more like your son. And so, God, I pray that you help us to have that right mindset. Lord, uh, I pray for anyone this morning who's feeling like the Chapman's God, where they feel like they're in, a, in an unfixable situation and the pain just doesn't go away, God. I pray that you would comfort them and be their healer and help them every time they feel that to say, I know God loves me. I know it's going to make sense. I just have to trust and hold on. Fill them with hope, God. I'd also like to pray uh, this morning for maybe you're here and, and you don't know God. You don't have a relationship with Him. But you're going through suffering on your own and you want to know the great comforter. That's you. In a minute, I'm going to say a prayer of faith just to help you get to know God as your personal Lord and Savior. There's no magic words. God looks at your heart. But you can just repeat uh, with me in your chair. You can repeat silently, and God will hear you. And it's just a simple prayer of surrender. And if that's you, I would like to lead you. You can repeat after me, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you came to save me. God, you see my suffering. You suffered more than anyone on the cross. And I pray that you would be my comforter this morning. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. 
Help me to love your word and to love my neighbor. Thank you for saving me. Be my Lord and Savior. If you prayed that prayer this morning, the Bible says angels are celebrating in heaven because you've come to know the Father. You've come to be a child of God. And if that's you, I'd love to, to speak with you, meet with you further afterward. At this time, I just want to open up the altars. The prayer team can come forward. If you just want to feel God's comfort um, in a new, fresh way, or, or you need to, to have an encouraging word from a brother or sister saying, man, God is going to make it all new. Just hang on. Your, your Sunday's coming. Then I, I just uh, leave the altars open. Thank you, guys. God bless you. You're free to go, but we're going to just have a song or two more from the worship team if you would like to stay. Right.